So welcome everybody to this fourth installment of the ANFF webinar series that we've been running for the last obviously three weeks um, and we've got another two after this one to go. Uh, this webinar series has, was born out of our wish to share all the wonderful things that we do at ANFF with our um, greater community that are involved in micro and nanofabrication and the sciences that we're supporting. Uh, we were going to do our wonderful showcase and do this over three days with a couple of hundred people in, in Melbourne, but unfortunately we have had to go online for this portion of it. But next year in May, I do encourage you all to join us in Melbourne to do this in person where we will hopefully have an incredible program of scientific and um, industry people who are there talking about how ANFF is supporting the recovery of the, of the Australian economy going forward. This series obviously um, is being supported by our sponsors who are involved in that um, showcase next year. And so we do like to say thank you to those sponsors for you know, sticking with us through this uh, very difficult period. This webinar series is based on the um, research priorities that ANFF has always been involved with and how they overlap with the emerging industry focus um, areas that the Australian government and federal and state governments are all uh, pushing us towards to ensure that we're able to recover in the best way possible after this, um, the year that has been uh, 2020. So um, a bit of housekeeping, uh, we will do the question Q&A through the Q&A function on Zoom. So at the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A um, screen that you can open up. Uh, we will ask questions through that portal and if you don't we don't get your question we will ensure that it is answered offline for you um, obviously this is being recorded so um, you've all already just ticked the box so thank you for that um, and it will be put up eventually um, on our YouTube um, channel so with that I will introduce our first speaker for our comms and cybersecurity uh, talk. Obviously, you can see his first uh, uh, um, slide up on the screen already, um, and it's from Andrew Zurak, our ANFF node director for the ANFF New South Wales node. Um, Andrew has is a world world leader in silicon-based quantum computing, and over the last year has produced some incredible papers and some incredible work that really shows how world-leading um, Australia and in particular Sydney is. When we're talking about the forefront of quantum computing. So with that, I will pass over to Andrew to impress us even more than that. Thanks very much, Jane, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. And thanks for everybody who's taken the time to out of their day today to have a listen to this. Um, so uh, as Jane's uh, said, I'm going to talk about um, silicon quantum computing and, and the uh, um, and the road of taking this from laboratory-based research through to industrial manufacture. I'll just mention that um, one of the great things about um, AMF is that uh, it supports research right throughout the discovery chain from very basic research right through to translation to industry. And um, AMF has been absolutely, instru absolutely instrumental in um, supporting the basic research that's led to um, now the um, commercialization of, of this research. <clears throat> so, I'll begin just by noting uh, three examples of uh, investments by major corporations in quantum computing space from Google, IBM and Microsoft. There are, now, there are many, many other um, major corporations now investing and, uh, and lots of startups being created. But uh, you know, I, I want to spend a brief moment just um, either reminding the audience or, or informing the audience of um, what quantum computing is. The basic idea in quantum computing is to, uh, rather than having conventional bits um, it, that is used in all conventional computing, which can be either a zero or a one, is to create an actual physical embodiment of a bit known as a qubit. And this can be any quantum two level system. And on the screen, I've uh, got here a couple of examples. The image at the top is meant to represent um, a, a two level energy, two energy states in an atom or a molecule or equivalent system um, where the ground state we can identify as a logical zero and the excited state as a logical one. Um, down below, I've got an example. This is meant to represent 
a, uh, a, a the spin of a particle such as an electron or a, or a nuclear spin and um, if it's a spin one half particle in quantum mechanics, it only has two possible orientations in a magnetic field, and we can um, associate those also with a zero or a one. Um, I'll, I'll be mainly talking about the spin of electrons, such as in the bottom example. Uh, but <clears throat> when we when we uh, use uh, real physical quantum states, um, we also have the benefit of the superposition of those states, um, and we also enable um, entanglement between um, distant quantum particles. And by combining superposition and entanglement, it's impossible to, it's possible to design algorithms that can provide much greater uh, uh, processing capability compared with uh, what is possible in a conventional computer. Uh, let me give you an example of one type of problem uh, where a quantum computer uh, can massively outperform a conventional computer. And um, uh, so I think that everyone in the audience uh, can probably uh, uh, solve this either in their head or else they can certainly scribble down on a piece of paper um, and uh, or if they uh, have their laptop in front of them, they can easily uh, multiply the two together to get an answer. It's very simple, 1643. I'm sure no one had any trouble with that. Uh, this, however, uh, is a slightly, is a more difficult problem. That's to what are the two prime factors of the number 2,183? <clears throat> well, um, usually when I'm talking to a large enough audience, I usually get someone who's a good mathematical savant who can quickly run through those things in their head. Um, but I would, I would guess that most of you in the audience um, are prob would probably have to do a lot of trial and error until you're able to come up with the answer, which is 37 times 59. And that is because um, finding the prime factors of a large composite number is a very difficult problem. Uh, there's no, in computer science, um, this is uh, believed to be likely to be a problem that cannot be solved in polynomial time. In other words, um, if there are n bits in, in the number, in the digital number that is being, needs to be factored, then um, there is no um, solution that can be done either in um, in a time proportional to n or n squared or n cubed. Instead, it appears to be more exponentially dependent on the number. And, uh, and so this issue of finding the prime factors of a uh, large composite um, created one of the first and most important applications of quantum computing. Um, so I now want to just turn quickly to what some of those application areas are before I get into the technology of silicon. And, uh, and this first one um, is this issue of finding um, the prime factors of a large composite. It was discovered by Peter Shaw in 1994. Um, and in fact, uh, the work was published 25 years ago. There was a very nice review of this work and interview with Peter Shaw in Nature just um, a, two weeks ago. So the significance of this is that all public key encryption that we require in order to keep all of our um, credit card details secure when we do internet banking and, and, uh, and commerce relies on um, the, uh, public, uh, this public key encryption process where um, uh, there is a public key which is a large composite number but only those uh, with secure communication know what the private key is which is one of the prime factors. Now um, and it, the security of uh, this encryption system that we rely on relies on the difficulty of that problem. Now, Peter Shaw showed in 1994 that a, um, a quantum computer could crack this problem in, in polynomial time, as opposed to exponentially difficult, um, uh, uh, exponential increase with the number of bits. So it immediately uh, got um, national security agencies very interested in this. Obviously, they are interested in being able to crack codes from a national security perspective, and it and, in, and it created the first major investments into quantum computing. Um, and and indeed, for the first uh, 20 years or so of the development of quantum computing, most investments were by national governments who uh, had this is at least one of the motivations. Um, so. But from a commercial perspective, this isn't really a big money spinner. It isn't really the thing that is the main commercial application, but it is the one that kicked off the technology. <clears throat> a much more important application is related to a, uh, a, an algorithm that was developed two years after Peter Shaw's algorithm. This was by another um, 
scientist called Lov Grover, who showed that if one has a large unsorted database, one can um, find uh, a the um, uh, can find a, a particular item in that database um, much faster than a conventional uh, computer could. In fact, there's a, a square root of n speed up where the size of the database has n components in it. Now that um, is not as fast as the exponential speed up for Shor's algorithm, but a square root of n can still be important when we're talking about huge amounts of data that needs to be processed. Um, the image on this slide shows a Facebook data center um, in the Arctic Circle in Sweden. And the reason that this is in the Arctic Circle is because the amount of energy that's dissipated in doing uh, all of the um, searching and storage of uh, um, images of, of data um, consumes huge amounts of energy uh, in the processing uh, of that data. And, uh, and so a great amount of cooling is required. And so Facebook, in order to uh, reduce the uh, cooling costs actually put this um, data center in the Arctic Circle for that reason. So quantum computing offers the opportunity to do much, much faster and more energy efficient um, uh, data processing, um, which is obviously becoming more and more important. <clears throat> Finally, just one other key example I'll mention is the ability of quantum computers to simulate real physical systems. So I've got a, an image on the right of an example of a carbon nanotube um, with some extra uh, um, uh, atomic inclusions in it, um, just as an example. But the general problem of trying to properly um, calculate energy levels, um, protein folding, etc., of, of large complex molecules is an incredibly difficult um, data crunching problem. And, and in fact, to get exact solutions, it's not possible even for the most powerful supercomputers on earth to do anything more um, than a molecule with, with a few tens of atoms in it. So, to act for, so for example, to try to simulate biological processes or uh, protein folding or, or catalysis and so on of more complex molecules, it's simply out of bounds for conventional computing uh, in, in most areas. Um, quantum computing um, provides an opportunity uh, to solve these problems in, re in reasonable timescales uh, and to move, for example, drug discovery away from a trial and error process uh, in the laboratory to actually being a computer-aided design process. So this has enormous uh, commercial applications and I've just mentioned the pharmaceuticals there, but advanced new materials can also be developed. Uh, it was Richard Feynman who um, in 1982 first postulated the idea of using um, quantum particles uh, to do this type of simulation. Uh, and since that time, there have been a range of different technologies that have been explored. I already mentioned that any quantum two level system uh, can be a qubit, but the ones that have been uh, most popular to date and most successful to date have been the two I've got on the screen at the moment, superconducting qubits, of which there is major investments by corporations such as Google and IBM and, and startups and others. And on the right, um, iron trap qubits. Um, uh, and between superconducting qubits and iron, iron trap qubits, these are the most advanced systems that are already doing tens of uh, qubit calculations. And, um, and last year we heard from Google who had demonstrated what's called quantum supremacy, where they showed that their um, uh, roughly 50 qubit system could um, uh, 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 do calculations that could not be done on a conventional supercomputer in reasonable time where they outperformed it. Uh, two other examples of uh, qubit systems where a lot of interest remains is in um, the NV, NV Nitrogen Vacancy Centre in Diamond, uh, which has an active spin that can be optically addressed. Uh, and another one is the technology using um, photons, particles of light, where you can encode information in the polarisation, for example, of, of those photons. Um, but the technology that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, as you know, is silicon qubits. And the motivation here is to exploit the incredible integration available in the CMOS integrated circuit uh, industry, which allows um, billions of transistors or individual components to be integrated on a single square centimetre of silicon. Um, and uh, just uh, recapping so, uh, some selected examples of commercial investments, I've already mentioned Google, IBM, also startup D-Wave, which is investing in superconducting com 
quantum computing. Uh, Microsoft has placed its bets on an area known as topological quantum computing, which uses a, 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 a newly, well, a proposed particle known as the Majorana fermion that's still in early stages of demonstrations of qubits. Um, Intel uh, are investing in both superconducting and silicon-based qubits. And uh, here in Australia, uh, we have a, a startup company uh, called Silicon Quantum Computing. The name uh, explains uh, the technology. Um, and this is a consortium uh, that's uh, spun out of the University of New South Wales and has investments from Australian and state governments and also Telstra and Commonwealth Bank. Let me emphasize, this is a very, very small subset of all of the uh, companies that are investing around the world. So I now want to talk, uh, I'm now going to move uh, to the research at UNSW, but before I do, I want to men just firstly acknowledge uh, an outstanding research team of staff and students uh, that I have working in my group, working on CMOS-based qubits. I'll, I'll, I'll turn to those, to that work in, in the uh, second half of my talk, after a little bit of introduction on some of the history. I also want to acknowledge collaborators, both at UNSW in Sydney and all around the world, uh, who contribute to the research of my group on silicon qubits. But uh, I want to begin with the history um, of silicon qubits, how it all started. And it started back in, um, well, in fact, 1997 was the original concept, but then published in Nature in 1998 uh, by Bruce Kane, who was a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, University of New South Wales, uh, <coughs> utilizing the what was then called the Semiconductor Nanofabrication Facility, which has now evolved into the Australian National Fabrication Facility at UNSW. And Bruce um, postulated the idea of using single phosphorus atoms um, embedded in a, a very pure silicon crystal host and storing information on the nuclear spin of the phosphorus atoms. And interactions then between these nuclear spins would be enabled by via interaction with their donor electrons uh, and interaction between pairs of atoms would be enabled by manipulation of the wave functions using electro gate electrodes on the surface, a little bit in analogy with the way that modern transistors operate. So Kane's original motivation for silicon was that uh, it was already known in the literature that spins in silicon at low temperature could have very, very long quantum coherence times. In other words, the quantum information could be maintained for timescales much longer than it took to manipulate the spins into quantum logic operations. The other major advantage of silicon I've already mentioned is the opportunity to leverage silicon microfabrication, which provides incredible integration. So um, after Kane's original uh, invention in the late 90s, uh, Professor Bob Clark, uh, who was at UNSW at the time, uh, really had the vision to found a national centre um, focused on quantum computing. Although it had a very strong focus and still does on silicon-based quantum computing, it also explores other areas, including photon-based quantum computing, uh, and now more recently quantum communication. So Bob Clark um, led the centre through uh, all of the initial early stages. Uh, it was then handed over to Jared Milburn uh, from Queen University of Queensland, who was the previous deputy director of the centre. And then in 2011, Michelle Simmons uh, took over and is the current director of the centre to this present day. Uh, so it's one of the longest running, if not the longest running centres of excellence uh, in the country. And in the early years of that centre, uh, there were two main technologies to try, try and realise Kane's vision. Uh, the first one used uh, this STM approach, scanned probe lithography, and the other one using a more conventional um, industry technology of iron implantation. This iron implantation technique uh, which um, utilised uh, an invention which allowed the counting of individual atoms into the device was originally invented by uh, David Jamison from the University of Melbourne and colleagues uh, and led in uh, 2010 to the first demonstration of readout of a, a single um, electron spin in a silicon device um, um, by an experimental team where the lead experimentalist was Andre Morello. And uh, so this cartoon shows an artist's impression of a phosphorus atom and its bound electron spin next to a, a device which is known as a silicon electron, uh, sorry, a single electron transistor, which is used to read the spin. And um, this paper published in Nature um, in um, 2010 uh, uh, allowed, showed that it was possible to 
to um, measure the spin of an individual electron with very high fidelity. Over here, we see the signal of a spin up electron. And here we see uh, no equivalent signal if the electron on the atom was spin down. So we have a very high fidelity or accuracy readout process for the spin. Two years later, um, in a paper first authored by uh, Jared Plara, PhD student at UNSW, the control of the spin was demonstrated. And then a year later, making contact with Kane's original vision, uh, the control of the nuclear spin was demonstrated. Now, one of the uh, early uh, challenges of experiments in silicon is that, um, and this, by the way, is meant to represent the silicon lattice with a phosphorus um, donor in the middle. The blue represents the electron wave function and the yellow represents um, silicon 29 isotopes. Now, most of silicon is actually nuclear spin free silicon 28, but about 5% of naturally occurring silicon has silicon 29 um, um, ions in it. And these ions undergo flip-flop uh, operations. They spin one half particles, and that leads to a fluctuating magnetic field, which causes decoherence. Um, now, uh, this problem can be solved by isotopically enriching um, the silicon to create almost pure silicon 28. And in a paper published in 2014, our groups showed that um, by having a one micron layer of silicon 28, this is this blue region on the surface and then fabricating a qubit device, it's possible to get extremely uh, high coherence, so-called Rabi oscillations of the electron spin. This is effectively controllably changing the electron spin from spin down to spin up and back again in a controllable way, effectively quantum knot operations. And to give you an idea of um, how much better that is than natural silicon, here's the equivalent result from that from a 2012 Nature paper, the first qubit in natural silicon showing that coherence dying away. So silicon 28 therefore uh, is the way forward. And since that time, Andrea Morello has really been leading demonstrations in um, a single qubit high fidelity control in implanted donors. Um, over the same period, uh, Michelle Simmons and colleague Sven Rogg have been working on the development of qubits based on uh, where the atoms are placed using this scan probe technique, uh, as originally proposed by Kane. And, um, uh, and th those groups have recently demonstrated uh, two phosphorus atoms that are able to show entanglement and uh, spin control between them in the last year. So um, in my last uh, five minutes or so, I wanna now turn away from these single atom qubits and on the technology that my own group is studying. And this is to try to exploit the mass production capabilities of silicon. And it was, and it was inspired um, by this paper in the same year as Kane's paper, a paper by Daniel Loss and David DiVincenzo in which they proposed using quantum dots as uh, spin qubits. Now quantum dots were devices uh, initially studied in the gallium arsenide, al aluminium gallium arsenide hemped uh, configuration that we use for high electron mobility transistors in which they were able to isolate individual electron spins. And these were the first demonstrations uh, from Harvard and from Delft in the Netherlands in um, 2005 and 2006. The main problem with this technology is that neither gallium nor arsenic has a spin zero isotope. And so it's not possible to remove that, those background decohering fluctuations. The solution was to move this to silicon and this is some examples of work from my group um, over the past um, uh, six years or so from the demonstration of the first qubits up to demonstrations of the uh, first high fidelity two qubit gate. The technology is based on a simple variant of a MOSFET. So uh, the cartoon at the bottom left uh, shows the light blue is silicon. The gray is uh, in this case, aluminium metal. Um, when we put a positive bias on, we induce a, a layer of electrons, a two dimensional electron gas of electrons below. And by inserting two extra gate electrodes here and here, and this device fabricated in our AMP facility at UNSW, um, one can then create tunnel barriers to isolate a so-called quantum dot. And we can actually count electrons one at a time as we populate this dot. This was published back in 2007. Uh, at this time, those dots had uh, tens of electrons within them, but we realized that by reducing this quantum dot down to in, in one of these transistors down to the one electron level, we could operate this as a qubit. And we did this in silicon 28 in uh, 2014 at the same time as Andrea Morello's group on the single donor demonstrate, demonstrated high fidelity control. So 
high fidelity control was uh, now possible, not on an atom, but now in a, a, a just a standard uh, nanoelectronic CMOS device um, fabricated using gate electrodes. And uh, the important thing uh, to appreciate is that the structure that we use to um, confine this single electron, it uses just a single gate electrode to accumulate electrons underneath, and that can be reduced to one electron in this metal oxide semiconductor or MOS structure. And this is exactly the same gate, uh, effectively geometry of gate stack that is used in uh, modern day transistors, or at least uh, ha had been demonstrated, used in planar transistors for the past two decades. Uh, last year, our group showed that we could get extremely high fidelities or control. The reason that this is important is because um, uh, ultimately in order to do the sort of calculations I talked at at the, about at the start of the talk, one needs to do error correction to uh, correct errors that inevitably creep in, but the overheads of that error correction becoming tractable if the um, errors rise much above 1%. In fact, preferably you want to keep those errors down to 0.1% or 0.01%. We showed here uh, an accuracy or an error of only 0.04% in this paper um, in um, uh, 2019, which um, put, put silicon qubits for the first time at the same level as the very best qubits explored in other systems, but in, a, in this uh, new tech, in the silicon technology. We then extended this type of device, again made in the IAM facility, and uh, in, in the simple way of adding extra transistors one next to each other or quantum dots next to each other, it was possible uh, to configure multi-qubit gates. And uh, here this shows control of spins in one dot, in a dot next door, and in a dot next door to that in a three qubit device. And we used this type of device in 2015 to show the first demonstration of two qubit logic. We're actually doing calculations between spins on adjacent uh, quantum dots each held under one of these gate electrodes in a CMOS compatible structure. And, um, and last year, um, we did the first ever fidelity measurements uh, in silicon of a two qubit gate, showing fidelities approaching the levels required for quantum error correction. Um, ultimately, um, we have to have millions of qubits in order to uh, solve the really interesting problems and commercially relevant problems uh, that the world is looking for. This is going to require um, large arrays, two-dimensional arrays of qubits. And so uh, three years ago, my group uh, designed a full um, CMOS compatible architecture uh, for a 2D array of these uh, quantum dots in a, in a lower layer in silicon 28, and then a superstructure of uh, a conventional electronics uh, that can be fabricated using CMOS with bit and word control addressing. And this can do a complete um, error correction code. I should also note that um, at uh, CA Letty in France, which is, which is a 300 millimeter wafer silicon R&D foundry, they've started to demonstrate qubits in their own right on a full CMOS 300 millimeter uh, compatible process, which now brings uh, the 800 pound gorilla of the CMOS industry at play. Um, I mentioned that uh, we've got some great collaborations going in Australia, for example, with David Riley at um, Microsoft Quantum at the University of Sydney. So David previously invented the ability to use a single gate electrode um, to ultimately uh, measure spins. He had, this spin had not yet been demonstrated in this paper from Riley from 2013, but last year we showed the ability uh, to read out um, spins for the first time in a silicon device in a collaboration with David. Um, and finally, the big uh, challenge uh, for um, uh, solid state, any solid state quantum computer is coping with millions of qubits which are going to dissipate power. And an important breakthrough um, last year, uh, published in Nature, was this work by Henry Yang from our group and, co and other colleagues, uh, where Henry showed that even at a temperature of one and a half Kelvin, it's possible to have fidelities uh, at the uh, quantum error correction threshold limit. Now, the, whereas most qubits operated either in silicon or in superconducting systems of the type that Google use, have to be operated well below 100 millikelvin. Now, that factor of 15 may not sound like a lot, but actually the cooling power, the ability of the cryogenic system to remove heat 
increases by over 1000 times in moving from 100 millikelvin to one and a half Kelvin. And so this now allows for the first time one to integrate conventional CMOS chips next to qubit chips. Uh, and uh, I think with that, I will just acknowledge my team now communicating almost purely by Zoom and uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and as always, I, 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 keep, I keep up for the first few slides and then all of a sudden I, my understanding starts to wane slightly, but I have to say it all looks as usual. The, the kind of work that you guys are doing is just an amazing um, testament to what can be done when you actually focus on a problem and actually go to solve it. It really is incredible. Um, when you're talking about um, questions, or I'm going to take the first question because um, I can. When you're talking about quantum computing and, you know, we're, we've been talking about quantum computing and you've shown the history of, you know, what, where we've been talking about it for the last 20 odd years. Where is the first application going to be? When, where, where is it actually going to start making money? Well, uh, interestingly, it's already making money, believe it or not, because um, a lot of uh, big corporates are recognizing that um, they're going to have to start to uh, explore quantum algorithms. So I, I mentioned in the longer term, we have areas like um, drug design. Another major area being explored is, is machine learning, so AI. Uh, and so large corporations, for example, Boeing, um, uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, Airbus and so on, are already beginning to partner with companies like IBM and Google in order to play with their early quantum computer prototypes and try out algorithms and, and are paying, paying for the privilege of doing that. So there's actually already people uh, beginning to explore con, um, uh, quantum algorithms on these systems. Uh, the question of um, what is likely to be uh, the first, let's say, killer app is still an open question. Um, a lot of work um, is being done uh, in the area of quantum machine learning. Um, and uh, that perhaps is uh, likely to be one of the first application areas. But um, I think as to what will be the first killer app, I, I think that the jury's still out. But I do note that, um, as I mentioned, people, are, companies are already investing, you know, real, real significant dollars uh, to begin to explore quantum algorithms. Thank you, Andrew. Well, I, believe it or not, that it, it did actually clarify things for me. So thank you. So thank you very much, Andrew. And with that, I'm going to pass over now to our next speaker, um, Professor Brett Nainer uh, from the University of Western Australia. Now, Brett's going to talk to us about the difficulties in talking to things that are in space. Um, obviously, these are not easy, easy ways of uh, communicating over such distances. Um, and Brett's been working on these problems for, for over 40 years. So over to you, Brett. Uh, thank you, Jane. So this talk will be on a different scale altogether um, to Andrew's. Um, so I'll be talking about very large scale things, uh, turbulence in the atmosphere and, and clouds and their effect on um, um, communication, optical communication between satellite and ground. So, um, the interest, well, I'll be talking about, uh, give a in, quick introduction and then talk about the effect of cloud cover and how we've uh, come up with a 40 year study of this and how it might affect uh, the systems. And we're looking, how we're looking at numerical modeling of scintillation. So I'll present both of those things. So just to sort of uh, fit in line with the theme of um, quantum. Uh, the group that I work with in Japan, uh, the Nas Japanese National Institute of Information Communication Technology, um, they've been working uh, for a number of decades now in optical communication in various forms, including satellite. And recently they had this publication in Nature um, demonstrating for the first time uh, quantum limited communication uh, using quantum key distribution technologies on a low earth orbiting satellite of micro satellite scale, meaning about 50 kilograms. Um, 
I'm not really involved with the quantum side of things. Um, they were using polarization to, to set the quanta, but um, I was helping with the design of uh, their systems uh, and analyzing the data they get from their systems and for the design of their next stage, which would be a geostationary satellite. So just to give you some idea of the trends that have been occurring um, in this area. So this is something that NICT put together and looking at the launch year of various satellites. And you can see uh, in the beginning, most of them were geo, um, uh, geostationary uh, satellites. But in recent years, they've become low Earth uh, orbiting satellites. So, so you can see the trend as, as we go in the decades that the data rates are going up from about, from about a kilobit per second in the 1990s up to the present time where we're heading towards uh, data rates of about 10 to 12. So uh, a significant amount of data can be transferred using these systems. And this is not the limit yet. The other big um, change in, in this area is the size of these satellites. So traditionally, uh, satellites were launched by countries and were very heavy of the order of 10 tons or so. Um, but in recent years, the trend has been to go down towards um, mini satellites and micro satellites and nano satellites. So, so the device that I was working on uh, in Japan was this uh, Socrates, which is a micro satellite of 50 kilogram class. And they demonstrated um, megabit per second communication using optical comms. The difficulty though with these LEO satellites is they have a limited lifetime. Uh, they, their um, altitude tends to go, drop down with time and so they get too close to the earth and start going up and drop out. So there's about two to three years with these satellites, but, but it's still very uh, economical and uh, very, can provide very useful information. To skip one of these slides, my introductory slide. So this is how the systems work. Uh, so you'll note on this diagram, there we have a, uh, in this case, we have a, um, an LEO satellite and there are a number of ground stations indicated by OGS. And the idea is that there are times when clouds are in the way as indicated by, by this situation. So the, the satellite cannot communicate to its ground station. And so what it can then do is talk across to another satellite, which can then download to uh, a, a ground station that is, has free transmission to the ground. And then the data can be transmitted through landline or a high data rate optical fibers to the uh, application. So in this diagram is shown uh, the use of satellites. Optical comms is also used in air aircraft. And one of the main applications at the moment is to get real time data on disasters so that the emergency relief teams can get to the area and get to the most damaged areas quickly. But this scale is shown in Japan. It's also possible to send the information right around the globe uh, by linking all these satellites up optically and then transmitting the data uh, through uh, a fiber link. So Australia sits very um, well in this uh, application uh, where we have areas that have very low cloud cover and unlike Japan that has uh, many days that are completely cloud covered, the idea is that they can then send the data 
through satellite down to a receiver in Australia and then send it back uh, to Japan is one application that's been looked at. So, the optical communications is influenced by the atmosphere. In fact, most of the time, it's one of the limiting factors. Um, there are two main factors that influence that. One is scattering, and there's very for various forms of scattering. We've heard of Raleigh scattering and near scattering and so on. The scattering that influences uh, optical comms is mostly the water particles. And so this is essentially cloud cover. So if, if there are clouds, then we can't transmit the optical uh, signal. But this is very different from the current method, which is using microwave, which has no difficulty going through clouds. The other uh, phenomenon of uh, nature in the atmosphere that influences this is uh, refraction. And the refraction that we're interested in is what comes about and we call scintillation. And this is due to turbulence in the atmosphere that's created by the solar irradiation, warming the earth up, warming the atmosphere up, and the production of winds that create these uh, eddies around of varying temperature and the refractive index is dependent on the temperature. So I'll be talking about cloud cover and I'll be talking about the uh, simulation. So first of all, cloud cover. So uh, we're interested in trying to locate uh, these optical ground stations optimally on the Earth's surface. And so we would like to find out you know, what has been happening uh, with respect to the clouds in any particular location. And our interest, of course, is the Australian region and its oceans around. So typically cloud uh, cover measurements have been done uh, historically using human observers who will go out at a fixed time each day, look up at the sky, and they will have various metrics on what they see and they write it down the logbook. And these things go back for many, many, many decades. But unfortunately, not really in a form that we can crunch using computation and collect the statistics easily. Uh, another method is uh, ground-based infrared images. <laughs> and uh, JPL uh, labs have uh, developed uh, images that they have located on the ground and they then measure the amount of cloud cover in a particular location. The difficulty with this is that this is a recent development and there's no real historical data. But uh, when we get to satellites, uh, there, are very, so many, there are many, many satellites that are up there and many that observe uh, the region around Australia. And this data has been going at, back at least 40 years, about four decades. And so this is very useful for us to try and make predictions on where's the best location in Australia to locate an optical ground station. So the data, the satellites, we, this is a rather messy slide, but the main point I want to make is there, there are hundreds of satellites, but not all of them are going to be useful for this problem. So we're, we use the, what's called the PATMOS data, and this is a collection of data collected by the University of Wisconsin. And it uh, involves using the NOAA satellite series and that series has been going since the 60s and there are various i think we're up to now 14 or something uh NOAA 14 so uh these these satellites and and the data we get from them um besides being over a 40-year period have been tested very extensively uh, using ground observations, um, calibrating various uh, ways with LIDAR and, and so on. So it's a very reliable data set. And algorithms have been developed and tested to, to judge particular uh, cloud cover levels. 
Well, so the resolution of the NOAA satellites, which are LEO satellites, is of the order of 0.1 degree on the Earth's surface. So this compared to geostationary data sets, which is about two and a half times larger. Sorry, 25 times larger. So it encourages us to use the LEO data. Uh, there are a number, number of other technical reasons that we want to use this data set, but I, I won't go into those, but uh, I will just briefly mention, on, since this is a showcase, I'm not going to go into the detail of the mathematics, but the algorithms we are using um, uh, have been extensively tested and essentially use uh, a base in statistical methods and they classify the Earth's surface into different uh, surface characteristics like desert and snow, ocean, um, forest, and so on. And that determines the type of radiation that they will get back at the satellite. And by calculating how much they get back from a particular surface, they can work out what cloud cover exists. So we've collected this data um, and we use it to, to look at um, changes in the climate around Australia and particularly the effect on the clouds. So here is a study that uh, some results that we've got. This is a study over four decades over the, the region of Australia, starting in uh, 1979 and going up to 2018. And so you can see um, when the chart, the bar down the bottom tells you um, the cloud amount. So if it's sort of zero, then there's no cloud. And if it's one, it's completely blocked by cloud. Uh, the, the sky is completely covered with cloud. And you can see from uh, this a result that there are areas that are continuously uh, clear of cloud in Australia over this long period of time. Particularly the areas in West Australia around Exmouth and this region here in Central Australia. There are some trends as you can see that there's been some change due to climate change in the uh, extent of these regions um, but given that this is a this is a trend uh, over many decades and uh, it's likely that it might continue it would indicate that you, you would like the best probably the best locations uh, as far as cloud cover is concerned is in the Leomoth x mouth area in fact curious curiously enough this is where most of the uh, observation site for in, in Australia uh, for JAXA and, and ESA and NASA and, and so on are located in this region and has the reputation of being the best place for observations in the world, having the lowest percentage of cloud cover in any place in the world. But there are other sites and there are many other factors that you have to take into account in locating uh, optical ground station, including uh, security access to high speed fiber and so on and so on. But this is just looking at the situation. Cloud cover. We can look at variations in um, each month, how uh, the cloud cover changes uh, monthly. So this is looking at the north, uh, northern Australian region around Darwin over the period of 2019 to 2018, so the average is over a decade. And you can see that in the months of June and July, uh, the northern part of Australia would be a pretty good location for the ODS, but certainly not in January and February and December region. So sometimes you might use a, a mobile OGS, and so this might uh, indicate that the best place to put uh, the OGS up north might be in June, July, and then you might shift it to a different area. 
just to compare that result with another region, so directly below down in South Australia near Adelaide, we can see that the cloud cover is in fact the opposite change compared to the north. Cloud cover is mostly in June, July, but is lower in the January, February and December region. Now you might want to locate your, your ground station in Adelaide for different reasons. In comparison to Leomoth, it's not as good, but uh, maybe there are always compromises on these things. And the advantage that you have is having many ground stations, multiple ground stations, is that if a particular ground station is suffering from cloud cover, then the connection can be made with a different um, ground, uh, OGS somewhere else on Earth, um, but in that case, particularly Australia. Currently, uh, Australia is working uh, with New Zealand, setting up um, a system of OGSs on Australia and New Zealand that might be used for uh, satellite optical communication. Okay, moving on then. Um, if we look at differences, so these are, this uh, diagram shows the decadal differences. So we, we're looking at the period 2009 to 2018 and comparing it to decade 1989 to 1998 and looking at differences, so trends due to, to perhaps climate change. And you can see that there are clear, some clear trends. Um, so the bar chart down at the, the bottom indicates whether the clouds are reducing to so the negative side or whether they're increasing. And you can see regions uh, where the, so off, off in the early evening of the west coast of Australia, you can see that the cloud cover has significantly reduced. And we have noticed the, the effect of this, uh, perhaps it's El Nino, but certainly the rainforest area down in Marga River is suffering from lack of rain. So, so this seems to fit with what we have experienced on the ground. You can also see through this how things change through the day. So we start off in early morning. It's quite cloudy if we look at the northern region. Mid morning still cloudy, but in mid afternoon the cloud seems to disappear and then it's quite good in the early evening. So there are trends that may be useful uh, data for selection but what you what you uh what you can clearly see even from this again is this region in western australia is ideal um, and there have been very little uh, the cloud cover is <laughs> reducing if anything might be good for optical ground stations but maybe not good for us as humans okay well then moving on um I'll look at the, the scintillation. Now, uh, scintillation is due to turbulent eddies in the atmosphere. Um, we've all sort of experienced the effect of scintillation. When you look at uh, a light on the horizon, you can see it blinking or look at a star, it sort of seems to uh, twinkle. So these are effects of the atmosphere as light comes through the troposphere. Uh, it's refracted in various ways because there are these eddies of different temperatures and there are different sizes. So depending on the size, it determines whether it's going to be uh, refracted largely or it's going to be, the phase front is going to be disturbed. And while there are numerical, uh, sorry, analytical results to look at very long distances or very short distances, the main re regions of interest in the mid-range is, is actually intractable analytically and so we need to move to numerical modeling. So the, the best model so far in this area is you take the region that you're looking at from the transmitter to the receiver and you break it down into, into these regions here. Uh, let's take say this region here and you essentially squeeze down all the effects of turbulence into what's called a, a phase screen. So 
on the phase screen, you use uh, a phase changing algorithm to change the wave front, and then you propagate the beam as if it's a vacuum between these screens. And so you establish a number of screens between the transmitter and the receiver, and you numerically model uh, the propagation of the beam. Now, this model typically has been used in horizontal prop propagation where these scintillation characteristics are the same across the um, transmission region. But when we're pointing to satellites, we find that the, the metric for scintillation, which is known as the refractive index structure function, for the larger that value, um, the larger the, the amount of scintillation is occurring. So the vertical axis is altitude and the horizontal axis is a structure function. And you see that it's in logarith logarithmic units. And in the first two kilometers or so close to the earth, you see that there's significant amount of scintillation occurring. There is this uh, tropopause that occurs here. And then as we go up in altitude, the amount of scintillation disappears until the, basically it's insignificant in this region. So the region in the troposphere close to the earth's surface has a dramatic effect, effect on the um, simulation. So then you have to change the model to take into account the characteristics that occur in each space between phase screens. And so then that begs the question, okay, well, where should you put these phase screens? And typically they've been put uniformly in, the, in over the propagation region, so the spacing between them is the same. But since the scintillation is far greater close to the Earth, you probably should have uh, your screens closer together uh, on the Earth, um, close to the Earth in, in the lower uh, two kilometers or so, and have them spaced out quite widely as you go up in altitude. So we've been playing around with algorithms, algorithms that sort of best take into account the characteristics of the simulation and give us an opti optimum model of what would be happening in the atmosphere. But when you put phase screens too close together, you find that they're correlated and each screen, when we generate them, we generate them uh, statistically and that's, those statistics can be influenced by the next screen if they're too close. So we have to actually take into account the correlation if that occurs in distance. So shown in this diagram is how much correlation you get as you space the screens as shown in meters here. So in the first couple of hundred meters, the, the screens are quite correlated. So if you don't space them wider than that, you have to take into account the, co the correlation. But close to the Earth's surface, in fact, we need to put these screens in the order of tens of meters rather than hundreds of meters. So we have to take into account the, the correlation. So uh, we've, we've done that. And um, what you can see here is some of the, the results of a simulation of a single run. So the upper one, the A's, are uh, taking into account the correlation. And the Bs are where we, we've assumed that each of the screens operate independently, statistically. And so you can see that in the, in the case of B, each one of these screens looks different. However, when we take into the account the correlation, there's no correlation between these two because they're separated uh, far enough, but these two are close enough that correlation matters. And you can see this region seems to be correlated with this region. So this is a, a much better model of the situation. So that's probably where I will stop. Um, this is uh, some acknowledgements of the people who are involved with this work. Uh, the team here in Western Australia, Helen, uh, and Merv mostly, um, that are working with DSTG with um, Tim Grant and Billy Mudge and Brad, Bradley Clare, um, 
Well, Lucia has been, is at UWA and he's been working on the scintillation material. Helen and Mary work on the sound color stuff. And we'd like to acknowledge uh, our appreciation to the Japanese, uh, particularly Mario Toyoshima, uh, for his cooperation and collaboration, and also the people at uh, Wisconsin who provided the data and helped us working with the algorithm. So that's uh, it for my talk, Jane. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Well, Brett, thank you so much for that. Um, it, is an, it is always incredible to us um, when we hear about the breadth of things that ANFF is able to support. And I have to say, checking cloud cover of Australia so that we can help with all, um, satellite communication is not one I would ever have come up with. <laughs> so well done on you for that, I have to say. <laughs> As we're over time and we're already so starting to lose people to the next appointments, I'm not. I'm going to suggest suggest anyone who has questions to please contact Tom, and we'll pass them on to Brett and get them answered offline in that in that way. Um, I'd like to thank both Brett and Andrew for a wonderful talk today. Um, we've really gone from one end of um, communication strategies all the way down to another, and I think it's been an incredible way of thinking about what AMF is able to to provide to the vast number of um, scientific areas in Australia. Next week, as I said, is energy. So please come and join us then. And all that remains for me to say is thank you, Brett. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you to all of the people who've turned up today. And we will see you all hopefully next week. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.